I design electronics for particle accelerators. Big science presents many challenges. And at CERN, we often innovate to meet these challenges. That's how the web was born, to make communication easier among physicists. Today, I would like to talk to you about open hardware, a new way of designing and sharing that we are developing with many other people around the world. I believe that, like the web, open hardware is becoming accessible to everyone, and that it has the potential to change our lives. Let me introduce you to some special and very distinguished open hardware designers. And let me start with a type of design which is very removed from what I do at CERN. Hands. Here's Ivan, an incredible guy who works as a mechanical special effects designer. He designs gear for movies and theater. In 2011, he designed a large mechanical hand, and he showcased it on YouTube. Richard, a carpenter in South Africa, saw the video. He had lost four fingers in an accident. He thought Ivan could help design a set of prosthetic fingers. So he called him, and they started working together. So after weeks of online collaboration, Ivan traveled to South Africa to finish the design with Richard. In South Africa, they also worked on a hand for Liam, a five-year-old who was born without fingers in his right hand. The news spread, and soon Ivan was contacted by many people who wanted to design and make these prosthetic hands. The problem is, a good hand goes for several thousand dollars, and children need to change prosthesis often as they grow. Fast forward three years to today. Here's another incredible guy, a university professor, John. He's also the founder of Enable. The small group has turned into a community, Enable, comprising more than 2,700 contributors. 3D printing technology and the network of volunteers have resulted in a huge drop in the prices of these hands. Today, you can get a hand for roughly the cost of raw materials, which is about $50. All these designs are open hardware, meaning that they are available for everybody to study, modify, and redistribute. And of course, everybody can make hands based on these designs. And when I say everybody, I really mean it. Here's Peter, a teacher of French in Virginia not an engineer, not a scientist. He started contributing the minute he heard about Enable. His first design was a hand for his son, Peregrine. Today, Peter is one of the most important contributors to the Enable community. And Peregrine is doing disaster relief work, disaster relief with his new hand. This would not have been possible a few years ago. Open hardware is doing to real-life objects what the web did to information. We already knew that we could transfer design files at the speed of light through the internet. But now these designs can be turned into actual things by virtually everyone. People in Enable exchange design files as easily as others exchange pictures or text. 3D printing allows them to turn these designs into actual things. With 3D printers going for a few hundred dollars, the field is ready for an explosion in creativity, innovation, and sharing. And this is exactly what we're witnessing. Here on the left, you have Ivan's original 3D printable design. And to the right, you have a very small sample of variations proposed by others. Prosthetic hands will never be the same. Who'd have told Ivan three years ago that he would change the lives of so many people? Empowerment of users is central in open hardware projects. Let's see how it plays out in a completely different context. Here's Akiba, another incredible guy from Japan. And you can see him here in Dharamshala 
India, near the foothills of the Himalayas. He's teaching people there to develop technologies that have, that have an impact on their everyday lives. One of the monks in a Buddhist monastery has started a hackerspace there. Projects range from street lighting to the monitoring of drinking water. And I'm going to take a sip of drinking water. <laughs> Drinking water is a big concern globally. According to the WHO, 3.4 million die each year due to problems related to the quality of the water they drink. 780 million lack easy access to clean water. NGOs make great efforts to install wells, to drill wells, and to install water distribution systems, but there are often maintenance problems. It is estimated that out of 500,000 wells in Africa, more than 30% are not operational at any given time. Things break, and the local people lack the knowledge and the means to repair them. Tim and his friends in California set out to provide a solution to this problem. Tim had learned a lot about water distribution systems in Panama as a Peace Corps volunteer. Diagnosing a problem in a pipe can be very frustrating in the jungle. With his friends Ben and Austin, he joined an NGO called Well Done International and designed a wireless sensor board called Momo. Momo monitors water flow and allows users to identify problems early. Because the Momo design is open, NGOs do not risk being locked into a single vendor. They have started deploying their systems in Tanzania and in other places in Africa. And they have also started organizing local courses with the aim of enabling the people not only to understand, but also to contribute to the development of this technology. It was important for Tim and his friends to make sure that modifications to the original design files remained open. And that's why they chose to license these designs under the CERN Open Hardware License. We developed the license to make sure our own designs could be shared freely with everyone. By requiring that design modifications remain free, the license perpetuates sharing and allows everybody to benefit from design improvements. We are also developing free software tools to design hardware. And all these developments are a catalyst for open hardware projects across the globe. We use our designs to conduct some of the most sophisticated scientific experiments in the world. But you don't need to be a scientist or an engineer to do important science. Take the measurement of pollution levels. Cities are becoming smart. But who runs these smart cities and how they are run remains an open question. The Smart Citizen project started in Barcelona uses distributed sensors to measure pollution levels and environmental conditions. These sensors are today used in cities all over the world. They are operated by a network of volunteers. And this guarantees the reliability of the data. There is probably no better place to illustrate this than Fukushima. Soon after the 2011 tsunami, there was a huge demand for Geiger counters to measure radiation levels. Stocks were quickly depleted. A group of volunteers had the idea of designing a Geiger counter with an integrated GPS receiver so you could drive around and log radiation levels. The design was completed in record time because it was based on previous open hardware work. To this day, with 24 million measurements, performed by hundreds of volunteers over three and a half years. SafeCast is the biggest radiation campaign, the radiation measurement campaign in history. The data are reliable the same way Wikipedia is reliable. Any departure from the truth can be easily spotted because many people who might or might not know each other are constantly driving around the same locations. 
there is no way you could achieve that degree of trustworthiness in a closed proprietary project. Back in Barcelona, people were beginning to see the power of using open hardware and distributed collaboration for solving other important problems, like bees. They teamed up with others in the US and in Europe to start studying what's happening to the bees. Through pollination, bees play a key role in one out of every three bites of food we take. Their unexplained decline is a huge food security issue. Nobody understands what's going on. The people in the open source beehives project started to design open beehives. You can build a beehive and equip it with a modified version of the smart citizen electronics. This version monitors pollution levels and environmental conditions and also counts bees in and out of the hive. By publishing these data on the web, they will allow other people they don't even know to perform sophisticated analysis and try to find the root cause for bee decline. You might have thought in the past that there was not much you could do to solve some of the world's biggest problems. But things are changing. The internet made distances irrelevant as far as information is concerned. The world of things you can touch is moving in that direction too. What we are observing is that for tackling some of these problems, there is no better team than you and a few thousand connected friends. You can't do it yourself, but you can do it together. Thank you.